Yeah, because you're you're pretty cute. That you know the the ladies are gonna like you. So we'll just put that up there for, well, for a my, my wife likes me, so you know that, that's all that matters. They, they can join in, you know, they could join in. My wife likes me sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. There's some days I wonder. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> trying to figure it out. Um, Roderick, you came to my attention. Uh, a big fan of the show, a guy I've had on the show before. Um, Michael just said, hey, you got to have this guy on the show. And I'm like, okay, who's this guy? Because you look up Roderick Green, and the first guy that comes up is an NFL football player. And then you I'm go, more athletic, though. I tell people that all the time. I have friends that say that. I tell them I'm, I'm more athletic. Well, you, you have to be because you do more than he does, and you only have one leg. That is true. So, and, that's, and, and that's the same thing I tell them. I say, you know, it's easy to run fast with two legs. Try doing it with one. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the crazy part. You don't just run fast. You also play volleyball. I mean, you've, you've done more. Um, I, I'm going to give the audience uh, j just, just a quick rundown. Let me see. I just pulled this up on the Internet. Um, um, named USA Volleyball 2016 Male Sitting Player of the Year. Um, yes, uh, medal at the Paralympic Games, one gold, three silvers. No short fee there. Competed in Sydney Paralympics, Athens Paralympics, track and field, winning one silver in the 200 meter dash and bronze medal, one long jump in 400 meter dash. I mean, it just goes on and on. It almost, and then it goes into it. It sounds like a joke, you know, para Pan American <laughs> Games. <laughs> World para volleyball games. At some point, it looks like you're just padding your your thing here. In an intercontinental cup, para I'm learning American from LeBron. Games. I'm learning from LeBron. You know, you got to pad those stats to be known forever. You know, <laughs> try to catch Jordan. <laughs> yeah, that that's basic. I mean, it just you're. It goes on and on. I'm. If I just read this whole thing, I would be wiped out. I, I'd be tired just reading it. It just goes on and on. How did it all start for you? Uh, you know, I know you came from a large family. I read that somewhere. Yes, sir. So um, lots of brothers and sisters, that kind of thing? Yes, sir. I got 13 brothers and sisters, uh, Western Road, Louisiana, and um, I, I fell kind of in the middle. And um, I looked up to my older brothers, and even though they, you know, they did older brother things, they picked on me all the time. Uh, but the one thing that they did is every one of them was in sports, whether it was boxing, track and field, basketball, football. and um, we were really competitive. And I can remember uh, my older brother right above me, Ben, he used to always say, you'll, you'll never be better than me at running or basketball. So as a little kid, that was just, in, you know, embedded in me. I will beat this guy one day. I will be better than him. So uh, we had a basketball court um, right outside our house. And uh, my dad and a couple of his friends helped build it for the kids in the neighborhood. And I was out there every morning. And then I go to school get from school, have to do homework, have to do chores. After the chores was over, I was out there uh, right up into the street light. Because anybody from Louisiana know you better be in before that street light. Yeah. And uh, Saturdays, Sundays, after church, I was always out there. And I got into sports just because my, my brothers and stuff pushed me. And I can remember early on, the doctors were like, you know, he's not going to succeed. And my mom saying uh, to Dr. Brown, actually, who I'm still good friends with, that um, – she said, you believe what you believe, and I'm going to believe what I believe because uh, we have God, and that's all we need. And then my dad, has this. he had this saying before he passed, whole lot of God, a little hard work, you could do anything. And I just took that and fell in love with sports. It became a big part of my life. Ended up becoming the first uh, person with a disability to receive a full athletic scholarship. Wow. I had to go play basketball at Oklahoma Christian. And uh, ESPN did a story on me there. A uh, kid from uh, Dallas, Jake Rep, saw me on ESPN. He came up, watched the game, was like, hey, you ought to run Paralympic track. And I looked at him and was like, kid, you are silly. There's no <laughs> way I'm going to run track, a punishment in basketball, yeah. just to have fun. And uh, he kept pushing me at it. And I told him, I said, hey, you you make your basketball team, I'll go run track. And he could actually play basketball decent. He made his basketball team because he was a track runner. And uh, so I ended up training uh, 99 that year for track and field. And I got destroyed. Like, I literally was just destroyed. And then that that big competitive edge and push in me that came out from my family during that process. And I told my mom, I'm, I'm going to drop out of school for a couple of years. I'm going to train for the Paralympics. And I'm going to show everybody that, you know, a guy that's six foot three, 200 plus pounds also has speed. I'm going to train for it. Wow. And ended up being one of the world's best within a year and a half. 
Uh, bigger than that, though, were you able to kick your brother's ass at some point? And oh, yeah, to this day. He'll come over and he'll try to <laughs> tell my daughter, you know, I used to beat him. I say, used to, would have, could have, and should have all mean nothing. Absolutely now. What, what can you do now? <laughs> As I always say, the older I get, the faster I used to be. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it, it just it just goes downhill. Um, it, you know, it, it's amazing that you you were able to 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 do all of that. And I, I keep thinking, you know, now we look at Paralympics. You know, we had the guy from you know he was from South Africa that you know the first Blade Runner who you know we saw that guy with the blades on his feet. Yeah, Oscar Pistorius. And, yeah, Oscar. I couldn't think of his name, and then yeah, he hit the headlines. He's a real friend of mine. Is he a nice guy? I mean, he seems like he st he started out a nice guy until he decided he wanted to, you know, take arms to his girlfriend. Uh, Things change after that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. God, you, you, it makes you wonder what people do. I don't want to get into Oscar's story. This is your story, but Oscar was the guy that brought us all into. Oh wait, these guys, these guys are real athletes, right? Yeah. You know, before that, I'm just being honest. We would see people; they would take off in wheelchairs before the rest of the uh, the, the the marathon would take off, right? Yeah. And they were kicking ass, and their upper bodies were built. And we saw those guys, and they, they were just built like animals. So we knew that, right? Yeah. Because they're in a wheelchair and they're hauling ass in that wheelchair. But until we saw the the guys with the blades on. It, it, it wasn't the same game, right? You guys didn't oh, yeah. have the, the advantage. When you're a kid and you're playing basketball, did you have the, the blade type feet or how does that work? I did not. Um, when I first played basketball, I had an everyday regular walking foot. And uh, it was almost like playing with a, 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 a piece of wood that had been shaped into a foot when I first started playing basketball. It, it was, but to me, I didn't know any different. You know, to me, that was, that was just normal. And so by the time I became a junior in high school, that's when my mom was like, if you want to go to college and you want to get better at this, we have to get better, you know, product for you to wear. We need better components. And so she researched. And before Oscar, there was Tony Vopen test. And my mom had saw Tony Vopen test. Uh, he had just ran in the Olympic Paralympics in 96. And she was like, hey, I want you to be somewhat like that guy. I want you to have that. And so I knew about the Paralympics, but I just didn't you know, knew what role the Paralympics would have in my life at that time in high school. And so uh, we went to Sablitz, or at that time it was uh, Novacare Sablitz. Scott's dad had uh, owned it at that time and he was running it. And that's when I got my first carbon fiber foot. It wasn't made out of wood or hard plastic. It was a carbon fiber. So it looked exactly like the foot that I had, but it had every time I would walk, as soon as I put it on, I could feel the difference from heel to toe because it would compress. It felt nothing like, you know, my real foot, of course. Right. The energy return was not anywhere close to my real foot. And so I remember that first game back I played. It was my junior year at West Monroe High School. And Coach Sidney Smith was my coach. He was like, it looks smaller. How does it feel? And I looked at him. I said, Coach, I feel like I could go all night. And he's wow. like, all right, we'll, we'll test it out. We'll give you the green light. And uh, we were playing against Wasman at the time, which is a high school uh, in Monroe, Louisiana. And I ended up with like 25 points that night. And I just felt great. Like I felt like I could play another three more quarters because the foot was lighter. Uh, it had a lot more energy return. And so um, I didn't play with the blade. I played in feet like that. I didn't touch the blade until I started running track. And like, like I said, in 99, mid 99. So, uh, you know, the, the feedback or, or the energy that comes off of the blade, it's, it matches the other foot. Does it, does it surpass the other foot? Because you're, you're, you're only an amputee on one side. And, and I want the audience to know you're below, you're below knee amputee. Yes, sir. I'm a BK below knee amputee. Yeah. All right. So that that's different than say Oscar and some of these other people right there above knee. Wasn't Oscar. No, he, He's a double below knee. And that was, that was the big, you know, fight, you know, yeah. amputee, do they have an advantage over, uh, you know, other sprinters with two feet. This is what I told people at first. And when it first came out, you know, it kind of hurt my feelings because I hadn't done any research. And I'm like, I'm sitting here busting my butt, my ass every day. And I'm sitting here trying to keep up with you. Now, all of a sudden, you're telling me I have an advantage. I said, if I have such an advantage, won't you go have surgery and have a foot cut off? Yeah. No, I, so, I, I agree with that. But go on. I, I didn't mean, to... yeah. And so then um, I'll take it a step further. And some of my my Paralympic friends are getting mad at me now, but I'm still going to stand by my beliefs. You know, this is American. I feel like I can still talk. Um, 
some of those guys who were double below knee started raising themselves up by two or three inches, four inches taller than what they would normally be. And so their time started getting faster. And that's when the controversy hit over the 200 and 400. If you raise yourself up, it turns into almost like a pogo stick because that leg is going to do what that leg is meant to do. Right. And it, it won't get tired. And so then it was a battle left and right. You know, they pull in this way in that direction. And so they had to come up with these rules and uh, a formula to see how tall you would be if you had both your legs and tried to come up with some good ideal uh, height for uh, double AKs and double BKs to run at so they weren't cheating. So there, to me, yeah, mechanical doping did happen. But for a single leg amputee, whether you're single BK or a single AK, a prosthetic is not going to give you advantage uh, because you're going to have more energy return coming from your sound side than your prosthetic side. So technically, you're having to teach yourself how to run, control your body, uh, and try to make that gait as smooth as possible, even though one side is producing more power than the other. So it's actually harder than a single leg amputee as an athlete than it is a double, in my opinion, when it comes to distances once you get to the 200, 400 and further. Yeah. And the other thing you can't do as a single leg is lengthen that, you know, that you can't get that mechanical advantage on one side because you have oh, to no. match the other side. So, you know, it would stand to reason. But has all of that been fixed now where they they figured out, look, it's got to be within this range? Yeah, they do have um, they do have some um, some some rules, some laws put in now. And uh, it depends on where you run, because sometimes when you get on a world class level, they actually do not um, measure the length. But if you go to a Paralympic event, they do measure the length. And so, like, you'll see these people that are running 45s, 44s, and then get to a Paralympic event, run 49 and stuff like that. And then people are like, okay, so what happened? Yeah. And then, you know, then they have to explain, oh, I'm having a bad day, when in reality, you're four inches shorter. You know, a bad day doesn't come in seconds. It comes in tenths of seconds. And, yeah. You know, and, and the, the average person doesn't realize that. You know, everything you're saying, it, it, I keep thinking of, of um, the Tour de France and a lot of cycling stuff because it's the one other place where you have mechanical advantages and, you know, they blood dope and everything else, right? And it got so crazy there that they had to start putting weight limits on bicycles because, you know, teams that had a lot more money could spend a lot of money on getting all these bikes that weigh 12 and 13 pounds. So they, they just went, fuck it. Everything has to be 15 pounds. We don't care. You know, <laughs> what it add up to that. yeah, it's got it. You know, no matter what, and we'll put weight on your bike if it doesn't come to that. And of course they also had to figure out, and, and in a lot of cases they missed the boat because some, some athletes like Spaniards and Italians have mm -hmm. a higher hematocrit level naturally, especially if they live in the mountains, you know, they can have, yeah they could be at 51 or 52 naturally if they're living up that high and they're always making red blood cells and they were, Oh, that guy was blood doping. It's like, no, genetically that's, that's their one gift. Yeah. So then they started trying to do markers. You know, we need to get a baseline on all of these people and figure out where their hematocrit level is to see if they're blood doping. Right. Yeah. It, it's crazy how athletes are always one step ahead of, <laughs> what you know who are supposed to be governing them <laughs> right yeah and <laughs> and every now and then someone gets caught because and, and the other thing and i don't know if you guys go i, I didn't mean to get onto doping but with you know I, i'm there now but um, well, that's part of that's, that's 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 part of what i'm doing now and the reason i got into where we're going in the future is because you know as you get older you got to do it so that's that's part of where i'm at too so i don't mind you getting into it no it's it, it's a crazy thing where you know, they I, and you tell me if they do this with the Paralympic people, too, where you can skip three scheduled, you know, where they come. How, how does that actually work? Because like you could like if you if they, they can show up and you can go, no, I'm not doing it today. They give you three get out of jail free cards. How does that whole thing work? Yeah, you get three missed tests. Uh, so like if they show up to your house and you're just like, I'm not doing this, like and you can see them out. Uh, I'm not taking this drug test today. So on your third window, that counts as a, a failed test, which means right. you could get, you know, whatever that sanction is, whether it's three weeks, six months, one year, four year ban, two year ban. Um, so, but you have three of those. And that's what uh, I think Coleman got in trouble for the track runner, yeah. uh, Christian Coleman. 
he got in trouble because he didn't ever fail a test. He just kept missing them. So in their mind, it's like, okay, you're doing stuff and you just don't want us to catch you doing it. So they have to suspend you. And, and the same thing applies with the Paralympics. So you, you, you have that grace of two, but on that third one, that's going to count as a missed test. It's amazing that they're letting athletes get out of jail free on, on some of the stuff. It, it drives me nuts that it's like, either let everyone do the chemistry or let no one do the chemistry. Right. And that's why they went to blood. Now. I don't know if you heard about that, but, um, the last, uh, we have to take like, uh, classes every year and go over tutorials and things like that. And now they're going to go to blood. Cause you know, they could trace back further. What have you been taking? Did you take this? Or what have you been doing? And before it was just urine. And so, you know, yeah. Hey, if I, if I missed this test and, I'm doing this and I'm at this part of my cycle. Then I could pee, you know, four days from now and I should be fine. And so oh. now we're doing the blood. So it's a little further. So you have no idea how far that could go back or how far they can catch you doing it. So they, they, they have tried that, try to catch, you know, catch you on that. So they just prick you, take that little blood and test that. Are the people in Paralympic games uh, doing as much chemistry as they're doing in, in um, the other Olympics? I don't know because <laughs> I'm not there to see it, but I wouldn't put it past any sport that is beginning to pay you to do your sport. One of one of the big things that kept, in my opinion, the Paralympics behind was the pay. Right. And now that sponsorships are beginning to come out, people are getting paid to do it. Some athletes, this is their this is their life. Like they they figured out how to get sponsorships, pay for speaking, and getting paid by you know their respective discipline. Then why not? Uh, so, and I, I think Paralympics in the past, I would want to say had less of it, but now that there is, like I say, money involved, there's a bigger incentive. And so, like I say, I don't know for sure, cause I don't see what those other people or athletes are doing, but I wouldn't put it past it just because of the, the monetary, um, yeah. uh, issue that we've brought into it. Well, Which once good money, thing because they're making more athletes and, and more of the competitions competitive. So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I wish they would pay us more, to be honest with you. But um, but with everything, you have your pros and cons. I, I think the money is going to follow. It, it's it's sad that you, I didn't know that, but I didn't realize it was that far behind for you guys. Um, but I love the fact, you know, I'm a big fan of the Olympics. I'm, I'm, I, I like sports. Uh, you know, I played sports my entire life. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it seemed like maybe two or three – Olympic cycles ago where we started seeing the commercials in between everything where they're showing the Paralympics along with everyone else. And I'm there going, yes, yes. Finally, these fucking people are getting their due because I think people think you guys just show up on that day in a wheelchair or something and don't train. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Right. I, I, I said to one of my friends the other day, I saw Hunter Woodrow. Uh, he's the, the kid that ran at Arkansas, the double BK kind of like Oscar. He's uh, he's engaged to the the young lady who I want to say she did high jump or long jump. I'm not quite sure about her from University of Texas. And um, I had we I, I was joking about him uh, probably three days before, and then all of a sudden I look up on a commercial, and I think it's a Lexus commercial. I was like, that's Hunter. I was just yeah. I was just joking about that guy a couple of days ago. So it's it's actually refreshing, and I, I wish there was more because, like you said earlier. You know, they think we just show up in a wheelchair, but they don't see the hours and they don't see like the physical therapy and the hospital visits because you have injury from training. Uh, and it, it, it's 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 funny to me that, you know, people look at me mainly because of my stature and they be like, oh, OK, you look like you work out, look like you train. Right. But a lot of other people, they just don't get that same respect because they're not built like I'm built. Right. And so it's 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 kind of disappointing when people like, oh, oh, yes, yeah, disabled sports. We train just as much if not more than able bodies the, the one thing i keep telling everyone is like you know if you go on a hike and you get a blister on your foot and you start hobbling you know, oh my god i got this blister oh my god it, it, two or three hours it's like these people hook these prosthetics to their you know to their stump and they get fucking blisters left right and center and there's no callus that builds up on that right i mean it's a piece of skin it's not like your hands or, or your feet where you could build up a callus you guys can end up with the, and, and then you got to go out the next day and work out again on that blister, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, my wife is actually, she's going through that now. She doesn't uh, train um, 
like she used to, but she's still active. Uh, she's a PA in the hospital. And so she's constantly moving from room to room, patient to patient. And uh, she's having to do things and up on her, her feet all the time. And uh, she sent me a picture and she had like blushes on the bottom, bottom of her residual limb. And yeah. I was like, damn, what is that? And then I looked closer. Oh, that's a blister. And it was a nasty blister. And I'm like, and you're right, because, I mean, she can't say, oh, I'm hurting. I can't go to work the next day. She still has to get up and go to work and do what she has to do. And it's the same thing as an athlete. Like, if today is leg day and I'm supposed to squat and deadlift or snatch or do bounds, then guess what? I'm going to have to do it because that's on my schedule. And me being as competitive as I am, I know other athletes are as well. They're not going to miss that day because they don't want to be – they don't want to take that chance of mentally killing themselves because they're like, oh, I missed this day or I missed a couple of days and then I have a competition coming up. They're going to do it. And you're right. They're, like when you put that prosthetic on, it hurts real bad at first. You get used to it. But then when you switch that, like you said, the uh, the leg with the blade on it or then you got to go back to the walking leg. Those fit just a little bit different. So each time that pressure is different, every time you put in each one of those legs and you have to go through that and you're still training and still doing what you have to do as an athlete. So you're right. You're one thousand percent right. You know, I think about that all the time. There was a girl that came on my show early on. We've been doing this show for over ten years, Roderick, and um, uh, she's been on a few times. Uh, Katie Sullivan. Are you familiar with Katie okay. Sullivan? Yeah. Oh, unbelievable human being. Um, she's above knee, and she was born that way. I think you were born with both legs, but had something happen right after birth. But what it was the hema something? Fibula uh, hemamelia. So I was born with uh, both legs and both feet, but I just didn't have like bones and uh, in my foot and my ankle, and I didn't have a fibula. So they had to amputate my foot when I was two. So I, w- I was born with a foot, but like I said, I didn't have the fibula and the ankle and some of the bones in my foot to help make up my foot. So they amputated my foot so I wouldn't be fitted with a a, a shoe for the rest of my life, and so I could be more mobile and active and get into sports. Yeah, uh, Katie was born with, you know, just perfect on both sides, no legs. And um, she she became an athlete and, you know, went through all the training. Area, and she would talk about all the training she went through and um, just listen to her talk. You know, she was, I think, a 200 and a 400 special. Yep. She was two four. And uh, she's won some medals. And like when you talk to her, she seems like a non-athlete, right? She's just a girly girl. When, when she's not, you know what I mean? She's just like Miss Southern Belle and, you know, and jokes come out of her mouth and all thing. But man, she, she talked about her training and everything. It was pretty fierce. So she was kind of my first entree into going, wait, these people fucking work their asses off. Right. And you have to have a double motivation because you don't have the limbs that everyone else has and you have to put on these prosthetics and all this shit can hurt and all of it can be a problem. That's why when I see the Olympics showing you guys alongside the other Olympians, I sit there and go, yes, it's time for this. You know, we, we, we deal with this kind of stuff all the time. Right. And we just don't, we don't look at it the same way and we need to, are are you familiar with um, another girl, uh, Jen Bricker? Do you know her? No, I don't know Jen Bricker. Look up Jen whenever you get a chance. Her sister was, was an Olympian. Um, her sister was Dominic Macchiano, uh, the, the famous American gymnast. Gymnast, yeah. Yeah, and Jen was born with no legs at all. Like, you know, she has nothing past her hips. And I remember, I, you know, um, Brian Gumble did a thing on her, on real sports. And that's where I, I learned about Jen Okay. And then Jen's been on the podcast a couple of times and she was living in LA and I, I went and met with Jen two or three times, just an incredible human being. And she does a show in Vegas now where, you know, she does acrobats. Um, <clears throat> her story gets me choked up every time because her parents, you know, were Dominic's parents. They got, they left her at the hospital. They saw their daughter didn't have legs they were Russians or Croatians or whatever. And they went, fuck it. We don't want this kid. Yeah. Did she just compete this year in the Winter Olympics? Can you look up Jan Bricker? Did she just compete uh, oh, this no, year? I, I don't know if she did or not, but she is an acrobat. So she could have been in the Winter Paralympic Games. Or okay. the summer. I'm not really sure. But she does acrobats. She does all this stuff. And later on in life, she figured out that Dominic Marciano was her sister. And um, 
just an incredible human being. Um, and the parents that took her, you know, the people that took her and raised her in their family, very Christian family, they came, they went, we're going to, they had other kids and they said, we're not going to treat you any differently. So anything you want to do, you can do. And I think she was a, just a tiny girl. She goes, you know, mommy, I want to learn how to roller skate. She went, great. Here's some roller skates. Go figure it out. She put them on her hands. She had them on her hands, learned how to roller skate. She learned how to tumble. She, she did all of this incredible stuff as a kid. She was on the volleyball team or maybe the basketball team. And it, she was doing all this stuff. And it was the same thing. I read something about you. I saw something about you where your brothers, your parents, everyone said, fuck it. You're no different than the rest of us. Yeah. You know, you don't have a leg. You think you're special. You know, I saw pictures of you with your friends, your family, the whole thing. How do you think that affected you growing up, knowing that you weren't going to get any special treatment for not having a leg? Uh, like I tell people when I go do speaking engagement, it made me angry in a positive way. Um, because the fact, you know, even as a, a younger person, um, I realized what they were saying, like you're disabled. So I knew from the get, they were saying you're slightly different. So we're not going to treat you any differently. And with hearing that, it made me want to take the frustration of not being like everyone else and prove everybody wrong. And my entire life, that's like I tell people, I, I wouldn't want to be an able body because I don't think I would have the same drive and work ethic in everything that I do in my life. Because with that, as, as a young kid and hearing that, it has, it has given me a work ethic out of this world, whether it's my, you know, my nonprofit out of Dallas where we raise money for kids or it's me doing drug rehab for troubled teenagers here in Oklahoma or playing volleyball, running track, playing basketball. I always want to be the best and I want to do it the right way. And, um, and, and I think all that came because my dad said the same thing. He's like, we're not going to treat you any different. Like you're going to wake up, you're going to go work with the pigs, the cows and everything else. You're going to do the same amount of work. You're still going to do your school work. And if you want to play basketball, you're going to have to put in the work to be the best at it. I'm not going to, my dad used to say, you're not going to half-ass anything. And if you start something, you sure as hell don't finish it. And so with, with him telling me that, I think now it is, it has made me a very hardworking male. Like I can't sit at home and do nothing. I'm one of those right. people. Like if I'm sitting at home for too long, I will go crazy. I always have to do something. I have to be productive or I have to be helping someone else. And because of that and the way my family and my friends treated me, I think it's made me a greater person. Talk to me about your nonprofits and, and working uh, and also working with uh, kids who uh, I think you meant drug rehab. How did you get into that? How did you find that? Uh, the nonprofit, I'll start with that one first. Um, I met this guy named Scott Odom. Uh, he played for um, Amp One and he knew that I played college basketball and I was going back and forth overseas um, doing some summer uh, stuff with them professionally. And he wanted to put together this thing for the Endeavor Games, which is coming up, I think, in two weeks here in Oklahoma, where uh, he put together his team and they would come here and play some amputees here to bring awareness to, I guess, amputee basketball. Well, he did know that I played college basketball against, you know, able bodies. Right. And so I put together some of my friends. Harry Johnson was one of them. He's from Ohio. And he also played high school basketball. He's a phenomenal track athlete. And I put together some other guys that I knew play basketball and we played them and we beat, we beat them pretty handily. And after the game, uh, he was like, Hey, here's my information. If you ever want to get together. And um, I got with them, played with them for a little bit, but me and Scott had a different mindset. Like we wanted to give back. Well, like we wanted to play basketball and help other people through basketball to show them that just because you have a disability, it doesn't mean that you need to give up on life. And so we started brainstorming. And one day we came up with ABI sports, MPT basketball, uh, invigorated sports. And um, we raise money now for kids that have cancer in Oklahoma city and Dallas. Uh, we have events, I think in the month of March, we raised like $25,000 for two different families. And um, everything that we do during our, um, event 100 percent of it goes to the kids nice. and so we we try to live off donations and stuff to help keep us going so we can put these things together uh but when it comes to the event we give all that money to the family or to the kids for their hospital bills or uh the last one that the little girl had passed away before 
And so we gave that money to the family to help them pay for some funeral costs and other hospital bills that they had accumulated before she passed. And so that's that's what we do uh, for ABI Sports. Uh, the drug rehab, uh, I was in college and one of my friends, Amanda Weens, uh, she had graduated, I think, two years before me. And she became a counselor here in uh, Oklahoma City area. And she ran track for Oklahoma Christian. So when I was preparing for uh, Sydney and in Athens, she would go out to the track with me and she would be my rabbit. She had started a little ahead of me and she would do all the workouts with me, the weight stuff. And she didn't have to. I mean, she still had to do her workouts for the, the college, but she would still come out at, in the evening because, she knew I still had basketball practice and do this stuff with me. And when she got her job, she said, hey, we're we're looking for mentors and we're looking for people to help these kids that, you know, come from lower income areas, uh, foster care, don't have dads or they have dads, don't have moms. And they're just going through some serious stuff. So I started mentoring. And then once I graduated, like I said, I was going back and forth overseas. I came home and that company who brought me in for the mentor stuff said, hey, we have a rehab position and we would love to like do uh, contract work with you because we know you travel a lot, but we want you to work and help out with the kids here. And what started out as something small, I want to say I've probably worked with over a thousand kids wow. here in the Oklahoma City area now. And so, and I have, I'm out in the grocery store. Matter of fact, I walked out the convenience store last week and I hear somebody go, Coach Green? And I'm like, what? And I look, and I was like, oh my gosh. And I won't say his name because I don't know if he wants me to, you know, right, right, right. Right. Or anything. <laughs> But like he just gave me the biggest hug. And this kid was he had gotten in trouble with the law, didn't have any of his parents. He was a foster kid. And now he has two kids of his own. He's married. He's working a, a job. He went to trade school, became a welder. And like he he threw all this stuff on me. And he was like, you know what? Thank you for being there. Thank you for being hard on me, being mean to me, being loving, being nice, being what a, a parent's supposed to be to me. And this, like I said, this was like last week or two weeks ago. I can't quite put it together, but I can remember coming out that convenience store and running into him. And it's it's incidents like that that make me happy to do what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, I was listening to something just the other day. We're recording. This won't come out for maybe two weeks, but we're recording this right on on the back end of, of that shooting that happened in um, Texas just a few days ago. This, this primary school. And I was listening to some psychologists saying, you know, there's a lot of times where we know up front that these people exist, they're in trouble, they, they put all these clues out there, and we just sometimes you don't catch them in time, right? Like, they, they slip through the cracks. Yeah. And, uh, and then you have that a tragedy like that, where all of these people are now dead, most of them in fourth grade. And, yeah. and we, we can't even wrap our minds around that. But there's so much of that, you know, so much mental illness going on. There's so much, you know, my hometown of Donaldsonville, Louisiana, I, I, I drive around. It's not the town I grew up. I, I left there in 1981. That is not the town I left, right? I look around, man, you could tell that there's a lot of kids on drugs. There's a lot of poverty. That, and, and you sit there and you go, my God, how, how do we turn this around? How do you change that? And then I do nothing. Right. I just sit there and go, how do we change all this? But do nothing because I'm not there. I'm not in the community. I'm busy doing all of this. But I look around and go, someone should do something. Well, then I look at you and go, well, fuck, here, here's a someone and he's doing something. And, you know, it's not about that one kid. You wonder how many kids you've changed and how many people that they've changed. Oh, yeah. And that's the big thing. That's the big thing. I don't think people realize. A lot of people say, "What are we here for?" Hell, to make somebody else's life better than yours. Because yeah. if you make your life better, then they're going to do the same damn thing because they look up to you. Yeah. Because I have friends who tell me all the time, "Why do you do that? Why do you put yourself in that dangerous situation?" Honestly, I usually don't cuss on podcasts, so I try to. I don't give a shit. I really no. don't. Like yeah. I know that God has put me here for a reason. And I probably won't know that reason until I'm dead. But what I think that reason is, I'm going to work my gift. And that's what I tell them. I say my gift is to communicate. People are drawn to me and they love my personality and they know that I love them, like genuinely love them. And that's why I do what I do. And so it, you're right. It's like, who have I, who have you touched? And then who are those people going to touch in a positive way to change their life? And the cycle continues. And that's 
in my opinion, that's what life should be about. Well, that, that's all, when you think about it, it's all any of us, and I, I hate to get into these kind of conversations, but at the end of the day, we're going to all be dead one day, right? Yeah. And it's what we left behind. Um, I saw a picture of, of your wife, and, and you, you have a, a, some beautiful kids there, at least one beautiful kid I saw. I can't remember yeah. when I saw. One. one. Yeah, and, you know, you look at that and you go, yeah, yeah, these people are changing the world. And whatever your dad taught you and your mom taught you, you're going to give it to that little girl, right? And she's going to take that long. We're going to be long gone. It's going to be their world, right? You just got to hope that we do the right thing here so that when they carry on, this place will be better. You know, and that's what I'm always hoping for. Um, I saw a video, and I didn't get to watch the whole thing because we had to start this podcast. And obviously, you coach other people, right? Yeah. For the Olympics. And I saw this one with this woman. I wrote her name down. Um, Vanessa Lowe, probably. Uh, Vanessa. I thought I wrote the name down. Uh, Marcel Dembon. Marcel, someone? Marcel? Yeah. Did you no. Marcel? She was talking about Coach Rod Green. And maybe it wasn't you. No, that was that was Vanessa Lowe. She's from Germany, moved to Australia. Uh, double amputee? Yeah, that's Vanessa Lowe. Okay. 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 She, she's the one who had to tattoo my uh, my name on her arm because uh, she came to me. This is a great story. I hate with a passion the word can't. Yeah, uh, you and I you agree. Like the fact that I had to say it, but you know, I, I had to let people know what the word is. Yeah. And so when she first came there, a, a lot of my my friends met her, and they were like, "This is going to be an issue because." she's like a very beautiful girl and she's a really girly girl. And uh, she has this mindset about herself that she's unable to do anything in life. Like she's hit her peak. And I was like, Oh, I'll just let her come visit. So she flew from Germany to Oklahoma and she stayed with us for about two weeks. And during that, that training time, um, I told her, I was like, stop complaining, do what I ask you. I'm not going to do anything to hurt you. Why would I hurt you? It makes me look bad as a coach. I remember, I remember this day perfectly. And we were walking side to side, and she said, I just can't do it. I say, look, I'm, I'm trying my best to be nice to you, okay? Uh, please don't say that word again, because I don't, I don't train women. I don't train men. I don't train girls and boys. I train athletes. Everyone is treated equally. Please don't say that word again. And so I remember uh, my friend Johnny, he's, he's a big guy. I don't know if you saw him online, but he's in a wheelchair, and he's from Florida. He's like, yo. Like if you if you saw a Greek god in a wheelchair, that'd be him. I, I mean, wait, what's his name so I can find him? I didn't see him. Johnny Williams. He is like we're really close friends now. Um, I'll send you some pictures of him. I'll, actually, I'll give you his information. He's a good one to talk to as well. But um, really? he was like, "Hey, stop saying that word. He's gonna hit you." And she was like, "What? How you know?" And she, he looked at her. He's like, "I'm in a wheelchair, and he hit me." <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, she was doing some tire pulls because I don't believe in sleds. I do tire pulls. Yeah. Uh, and she was doing a tire pull. And in the middle of the tire pull, I'm running next to her to try to motivate her. She's like, I can't do it. And before she even finished, I punched her in the arm and she failed. And I looked at her. I said, You can do anything you put your mind to. Let's go. Next thing you know, she started breaking world records and winning gold medals. After that day, she never said that word again. And me and her had a great relationship. She told me, she said, I said, you know what? I'm not going to take you to a gold medal. I said, I'm going to take you to a world record. And she said, what? I said, you'll win a world record work. And I said, I see potential in you that you don't see in yourself, but I'll get you there. And she said, if I, if I win a world record, I'll tattoo your autograph on my arm. And she did. She went to Rio, broke two world records and autographed my name on her arm. I, I watched, there was a little Vimeo thing. It was about 12 or 15 minutes long. And right before I had to, because I'm always uploading the podcast before, and I'm, I was running some video in the background. I, I said, let me just see what this one is. And I got about five or six minutes in. I can't wait to go back and watch the rest of it because she was talking about you. And it's like, you know, this guy doesn't take no for an answer. This guy is this, this guy is that. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to love this guy. I, I can't wait to talk to this guy. And you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the can't word because, you know, you don't know anything about me, but I, I worked, I, I, I trained I like people. <laughs> oh, you, you, so you know a little bit about me. So I trained people for, you know, better part of 40 years, 35 years. And 
And then I took everything to the internet, right? And I wrote a book and then I started doing these movies and everything. And one of the things I do is I take phone calls, right? So people can sign up and do a phone call with me either a half an hour or an hour and they can ask me anything, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, my wife, my friends, everyone said, why do you do these phone calls? You don't need to do this. You're, you're making movies. You, you have books. You have the podcast. You have, I own the vitamin company. You don't need to do this. What are you doing? It was like, no, you don't understand. This is what I do. I'm a coach. That's it. I coach, period. End of story. And if I can't coach, I'm done. Right? And the one thing, when I hear this in the phone calls, they'll go, they'll tell me everything and they'll go, yeah, but. Yeah, but it's like, no, no, I don't do yeah, but. I don't do yeah, but. And they'll say, yeah, but I tried that, but I can't. Can't, never could. You know, you know we all have the same thing, right? Take, Sound like my daddy. Yeah, can't, can't never, never could. could yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Take, I, yeah, butters drive me nuts. If you take the yeah, but out of the situation, you know, there's a universal truth. Now we live in a world where people go, oh, it's my truth. Fuck your truth. There's a truth. There's a universal truth. I don't care about your truth. I don't care about my truth. I just care about the truth. Yep. Right. And if we can get to that, if we could just get to the real truth, then you can move ahead. Right. And, you know, I, I wrote in my book, you know, people worry about IQs all the time. I worry about FQs. Failure quotient, the number of times you can fail and come back. You can fail, you can fail, but if you keep trying, every successful human being I know, whether it's in track and field, whether it's in business, you talk to any Fortune 500 company guy, and I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of them because that's who used to hire me. Every one of them, they don't sit there and tell you about their success. They talk about their failures on a way to that success. Yep. Right. And to that point, um, I'm still athletic. I still shoot skeet at, at a competitive, at a national level, right? Oh, wow, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not that good, right? I'm still learning that game. I'm better at other shotgun sports, but I'm still learning skeet. And I was talking to a guy who's gone 700 straight. If you go 100 straight, that's a big thing, right? Yeah. I've, I've talked to people that have gone seven, 800 straight with no misses. This is practice. This is competition. They, I mean, to get your brain to that moment where you could go seven or 800 straight without a miss, that's just an incredible feat. That, that's every time you yell pull, you know exactly what you're going to do. And your, your brain is there. Everything is on, right? I asked a guy once that, I said, you've gone 700 straight several times in your life. He goes, I said, how does that start? He goes, they always start with a miss. And I, I thought about that and I went, huh, until this moment, I never thought about that. And that's just like every one of these rich guys or athletes and everyone else that talk about their failure quotient, right? The number of times they failed until they didn't fail anymore. It's just like this girl um, um, you were just talking about. She, and, and I think I remember seeing in that video, she said, I, I, I was at this Olympics and I had this time and I went to the next Olympics. I had the same time and went to the next Olympics. I had the same time. And it wasn't until she met you that she, you know, it was never her body. It was never about taking PEDs. It was about her getting her brain straight. It was her mind. It was 100% her mind. And I, and, and I, I, I don't know what it is and what we need to do for the younger people. Cause you had mentioned earlier, it's like, we're going to be dead and gone and it's going to be their world. And it's like, I tell people it's, it's like a religion, um, whether it's Christian or Muslim religion, religion is the one thing that can get anything going. It could get war going. It, it could bring, bring peace. Uh, it could bring hate. It could bring love. And we need to get in our kids' minds that they have the ability to be successful and do positive things like we do religion because they can jumpstart a whole new world that we never could see because of their positive thinking. If we taught our kids like we do, like, like religion is taught in certain countries. And I tell people that all the time, your mind and what you believe in. And if you believe in yourself and your mind is set that you're going to be positive, could be the most atomic bomb on this planet. 
Well, it, it's just, it's stronger than any computer. And look, I've always I tell people all the time for an idiot like me to make it out of Donaldsonville, Louisiana. And it was all and it, it's the same for you. It was the step, right? Yep. I was in Donaldsonville. I had nothing going on. The only thing I was good at is football. And when I started going around visiting colleges, you know, LSU just assumed I was going to go there because it was right across the river. Right. And I knew the athletic director. So they were like, yeah, yeah, we got him. He's coming here, you know? So they didn't recruit me that hard. And so I started going around Ole Miss, you know, Steve Sloan was still at Ole Miss. I, I even took a visit to Alabama, even you, you know, ball, uh, Bear Bryant was still there. I knew I would never play there. Right. Um, but I took my visit because it was Bear Bryant and I got to meet him you know, and this whole thing. And I went to all these different colleges and then I went to Tulane and this is back when Tulane still had actual real football. Right. And um, I went, you know what? Things are different here. These kids are thinking differently. This is a whole different ball of wax. I want to be part of this. This is where I want to be. So I did that. Right. I, I said, I'm going to go to Tulane and just do what's doing at Tulane. And it was the smartest move I could have ever made. And by the way, I played on two teams who beat LSU in back to back seasons. It was the last two times, you know, we beat them. We beat them at LSU 31 28 when uh, Dalton Hilliard was still in the backfield. Yeah. Okay. I'm a big football guy. I, I do remember that year. Yeah. I, I love football. Football is my thing. Um, yeah, Tulane almost got us this year too. I'm gonna I'm jump to now. I, yeah. oh, I'm a big yeah. OU fan. Yeah. And yeah. I remember my, my my daughter. She wanted to go to a bounce house. And I was like, Oh yeah, they playing Tulane. We can go to the bounce house. <laughs> and I almost had a heart attack in there on that trampoline. <laughs> yeah. No, Tulane. I mean, and the other thing we had that was going on back then was uh, uh, John Hot Rod Williams was at Tulane, and we came out of that that swamp together same year. Um, great, great kid, man. Just a great kid. He played. He played down in, in Miami for most of his career. After that, but, and he's yeah. passed away. He's no longer with us, which is odd because we're not that old yet. Yeah, I'm gonna say you. You are not old by any stretch of the imagination. Like, like I said, like probably like you did me last night. I was reading up the night before. <laughs> I, I researched you. I, I like knowing who I'm talking to. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's how I like to roll. It's like, let me just go find out about this guy. And then you learn, oh, he's a pretty cool guy. I don't need notes on this guy. I just talk to this guy. He, he's going to bring the guns, right? My little, one, guns. My, little, my little one wants to be in this podcast so bad. Pull her in. Oh, Let's man. say hi to her. Come, on. Come here. Is she coming? Yeah, she's coming. We we have a lot of land. She keeps looking at me. Come here, baby. <laughs> she just got out of the swimming pool. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Avea. Avea, how are you? Good. Good. What's the weather like? Is it warm enough to go swimming? Yeah. Yes, but it's sir. really cold in the pool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, you can handle that, right? You can handle the cold weather, right? No. <laughs> you got a southern girl there, right? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, the temperature, the, the thermometer comes for me. That's for sure. The thermostat. <laughs> oh God, I can't stand cold anything. No, nah, it's about what ninety degrees here today. I don't like it when it's cold in the water, but when it's cold outside, it's fine. Oh, so you're okay with cold weather? It's just everything else. Yeah. Yes, sir. You. Yeah. Everyone, everyone knows me as Vinny. No one calls me sir. But I get it. Uh, I'm, I still got that southern part in me, that Louisiana part. Yeah, no, I get it. But you see, I look so young. I don't look like a sir. That, that, that's no problem. <laughs> uh, Roderick, hang on just a second. I got to pay the bills here. Folks, um, you know, we all go shopping. Uh, no, no, we're not doing Amazon. We're doing Villa Capelli. Villa Capelli the longest running sponsor of the show. They've been with us for 10 years. Paul Capelli started a great company, Villa Capelli Olive Oil. You want to go check them out. Villa Capelli, um, look, the fact of the matter is in this country, you're able to cut olive oil up to 40% with seed oils and still call it 100% pure olive oil. That's a fact. 
There are other good olive oils in this country, but the one I can vouch for is Villa Capelli. As a matter of fact, I believe in them so much that we use Villa Capelli at my vitamin company in our vitamin D. We mix our vitamin D. You got to hook it to an oil. We put it with Villa Capelli, the finest oil coming out of Italy. I believe in this stuff. I love this stuff. And it's great tasting. You want to save some money? When you go to Villa Capelli, get to check out, put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, and you will get what? Oh, nothing. Just 10% off. 10% off at Villa Capelli by putting in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, get 10% off. If you spend over $100 even after you discount, you'll also get free shipping. So buy a couple of things there, get it over 115 or so, 10% discount, you'll be over 100 get the free shipping. That's another way to save. And I always say get that three liter tent, it lasts a long time, and you won't have to go shopping there again for a while. Uh, Villa Capelli, let them know we sent you. We're talking to Roderick Green here, uh, Olympian. Rod, uh, I want to get back to the Olympics just for a second here. You, you've you done volleyball. You haven't done Olympic basketball, have you? Or No, um, I wanted to do Paralympic basketball, but by the time um, I got into the Paralympics, they had switched from standing basketball uh, to wheelchair basketball. Okay. okay. And so um, I didn't want to um, go to the point where I had to sit down and have to relearn the game. Uh, I wanted to be standing up and being able to use my athletic abilities and uh, my knowledge of that game standing up. And so when they told me about wheelchair basketball, I, I declined uh, because all I knew was standing. So that would be almost like walking again. And that wasn't something that I was wanting to do because at the same time I was still playing college basketball and um, um, running track as well. So how did that work being in the same Olympics doing track and basketball? They're both summer games, right? Well, basketball, I played in college. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I meant uh, volleyball and track. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, when I, when I first got into it, I just did track. I didn't get into volleyball until 2007. And so I would have to look at my track schedule, talk to the volleyball coaches, see what that schedule was. And I would have to go to track meets that didn't conflict with volleyball uh, matches. And so I did that up until 2013 until I officially retired from track. And um, it, it actually wasn't hard at all. I mean, it's just to me with scheduling and planning and putting stuff together and I think it was just so easy because I had to worry about so many af other athletes before then putting their schedule together, their workouts together, that it was just easy for me to do that for myself. And um, so it wasn't hard for me at all. Uh, what's the hardest thing is I made a, a deal with one of my younger athletes who's an amputee now that I would race in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm running in a master's track meet that I've been training for. And um, so we'll see how that turns out. How hard is it for someone like you to be competitive like that? You know, just pull, you know, just pulling it out of your ass. I mean, how long have you been training to, to get back into this master's program? Uh, December, January. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't hard. Um, honestly, um, when I first stepped onto the track, that first two weeks was like death. Uh, cause I, I, I did a 400, 300, 200, uh, 150, 100, a ladder. And then I went back up. Uh, I went at about 70% working on technique, form, breathing, and each run had two minutes recovery in between. And I just hit, tried to hit every, uh, 100 at the same pace and then just hold after that. And so for the first two weeks, that was hell. And then after that, my body was just like, oh, you're just a bigger fella doing the same thing. And so now I do these runs. I just don't get tired. Now I'm just trying to see. I hadn't timed 100 because when I was younger, I never timed 100. Like when people was like, oh, what do you think you can run? I was like, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> like I would go into the race. And so I'm doing the same thing now. Like, right, I have so no where, where, where do you think you're going to be now versus when you were in Olympic shape? Do you think you'll be anywhere close to that? I probably run about a 12, four, 12, five. And then, uh, which is still shape. amazing, you know, still amazing. Yeah. I was close to low 11s, 11, four, uh, 
right before the mid 11 and lower. Wow. So, it's crazy. Speed. Yeah. yeah. And so, but, and like I said, um, kind of the reason I got on here, uh, what even got me to do that was because I started doing keto and intermittent fasting because when I ran track, I was like 200, 204, six foot three. And by getting on the track, it was just smooth, easy running. And over the years, you know, people teach you, oh, you need such and such meals a day and you need to eat this and that and another. And so I got caught in that. But the problem was when I got injured, uh, 2014, I uh, sustained a knee injury and a hamstring injury. And that's when I put on the most weight. I went from like 204 to about 260. And from 260, I shot up to 322. And in August, I walked in front of a mirror and kind of like I do with most stuff in my life as far as sports is concerned, I said, I will never look like this a fucking game. That's exactly what I said. And my wife was like, what? I said, I'm, I'm not going to look like this again. And this was August. I weighed 322.8, so pretty much 323. And started uh, doing keto, intermittent fasting. And now this morning, I'm down to about 259. Wow. And, and since August. And that's even with like the fasting, my meals are larger because I do lift heavier weight and stuff like that. Um, uh, starting Tuesday, though, I'm going to do what I consider um, a keto cut. So I'll eat keto, but I won't eat as many calories. And yeah. so uh, I'm going to start doing that because we also, after I do this race, I'm going to the Netherlands for um, a tournament that they have here for sitting volleyball. And I want to be not peak uh, uh, condition just yet, but I want to be about 245, 240 before I go there. And then before World Championships in November, I want to be about 220, 215. That, that's pretty heady. And you know, it's amazing that it, you went keto in August of last year. Just a few months later, you, you decide to, hey, I'm going to run a master's program. Were you thinking about that when you were weighing well over 300? <laughs> not even close my body my body started thinking about it because i would literally wake up and be like damn i feel good yeah. and and so i was training i was like i said i was training this guy here in oklahoma he played football at the university of central oklahoma amputee and i just give him a hard time all of it you know i give all my athletes a hard time you heard about vanessa yeah <laughs> and he's like you hadn't run and da -da -da. i was like i don't have to it's, it's almost like michael jordan what do i have to prove to you you have to catch me <laughs> and so he was like, oh, I bet you won't run a master's. And I was like, I bet you I will because I, I was feeling great and I still feel great. And I think, honestly, knowing my body as well as I do, and as long as I've been doing this with the like a clean diet and the training, people have always looked at me as like, you're a big guy. There's no way you're going to run fast. And I think I'm still going to prove him and everyone else wrong. Well, uh, I, I, I'm going to have to have you back on the show so we can talk about this, especially after you, you go back through the volleyball thing and everything else, because, um, you know, whenever I have someone as motivating as you on the show, I, yeah, if you don't mind, I, I would love to have you back again and again. And I, I'd like to see you get down to that 202 pound guy that you were before and see if you can, or do you have any interest in getting there? No, 215, because I raced at 215. And actually, when I raced at 215, that's when I ran my fastest times. Cool. Like, cool. yeah, I started out about 200. And then as I gradually put on muscle, I started getting faster. But, of course, I was gaining a little bit of weight. But when I hit 215 for about a three-year period, that's when I was unbeatable. And so that's why I said between 215 and 220 for volleyball as well for the world championships. Because uh, just knowing my body – my age, how I feel, my body build, because I'm a wide human being. No matter how small I get, I have those wide shoulders. That's right. you know, courtesy of my father. Um, <laughs> I, I, I carry weight different than other people. So me at 215 probably would look like someone at 200 right. because people are just so used to seeing me so big and I have the wide shoulders. So 215, I think it'd be good. And honestly, if I get to 215, I might race again just in another Masters just for the the, the, the fun of it. No, it would be great to see someone like you doing that. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to Katie Sullivan. 
you know, she she was just driving along and plucked down a podcast like 10 years ago and heard my show and she was gaining weight because she was out of sports at that point. She was gaining more and more weight. And she just looked around and, and said, you know, I might as well try what this idiot is talking about and see if it works. And she did and started losing weight and lost more weight. And then she was eventually leaner than she was when she actually competed in the Olympics and she began to get pissed off because she went, wait a minute, I had the whole Olympic training center telling me, you know, work out three times a day and just don't eat at night. You know, you're, you're eating too much. And she goes, no one told her all she had to do was cut carbs out and she could still run as fast or, or work as hard as she did when she ate carbs. No one had told her that. And this is the fucking Olympic committee. What say you? Yep. Katie, if you, if you see this podcast, I'm with you. I legit had that mindset probably last night because I think I spoke to you two days ago. So it was two nights ago. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm driving in my car and I'm thinking, I used to wake up and skip breakfast. I would eat a lunch and I didn't eat many carbs because as, as an athlete, I was, everybody's like, oh, that's horrible. All my trainers, that's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah. That's, you yeah. shouldn't do that. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get this. And as I got older, the only, I think the only thing that was saving me was the workouts and everything. And I was young. So, I metabolize different foods and stuff differently than I do now. And of course, you know, as you're younger, you got that, you, you have the benefit of being young. Let's just put it that way. Oh, absolutely. And, and now that I'm old, I'm like, if I did this and not listen to those people and only ate my lunch and my dinner and had my meals the way I had them, I probably wouldn't have shot to 260, 265 and then to 320 some because I made myself kind of like, become addicted to food because yeah. at first I would never get hungry. I wouldn't get hungry for carbs in this, but then they told me I need to eat five times a day to maintain this muscle mass and that and that. I would wake up and I would be hungry at nine in the morning. I was like, I'm never hungry at nine. And so it, 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 it does piss you off a little bit as an athlete that it's, they won't admit it. They'd be like, Oh, the science behind this and they're going to have their excuses. But you, people don't realize that eating that many times is an addiction. You're the grayling. You're training your body to get hungry at certain times a day, because that's what they've told you to do. And you've programmed your body and your body is the greatest, most beautiful computer on the planet. And so what you're doing is just programming it to be hungry five times a day, which I never was before then. And by the way, that's something I've always talked about, Roderick. Um, it's like, you know, we, we can program our bodies to do anything. And just like you programmed it to, in, in my book, I called it remapping, you know, just like you can remap a computer or do anything. Once you, you get into the carbs, you have to remap yourself to go back off of the carbs. That's why, you know, at my website, I do this thing where, you know, I have a free PDF. I, there's no click funnel. There's nothing. You just go get the PDF. It's free. I've been yelling for years that I'm going to charge for it at some point because I've given it away for over 300,000 times for free. And I got a feeling if I even put a $10 charge on it, that people might take it more seriously. You're yeah, just, just charging a couple of bucks. Anything you charge people for, they're going to take it serious because they don't want to waste their money. Yeah, so go get it for free, Rod, before I put a charge on it because I'm going to do it at some point, man. And um, I keep threatening it, but I just never do it, you know, because, you know, we talk about Michael Just and some of these people who, you know, they found me, they found the PDF, they lost weight, they got better. And I'm always worried that someone might go, ah, $10, I'm not going to do it. That's the person I want to help. And that's why every time I think about putting the $10 charge on it, I go, ah, oh, man, because there's a guy, his name is Scott King. I, this guy was 600 pounds, right? And now he weighs like 250 something. He's running triathlons. And as a matter of fact, Michael just met this guy to give him a free bike or to sell him a bike or something because this guy wanted to start running triathlons. It's like this weird community of people that I've put together and they all did it for free. And there's something that I love about that, right? They didn't have to pay me a dime. They didn't have to go on Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers or give some bullshit diet a chance, Slim Fast or whatever. It, it's like, here's the free information, that universal truth I was talking about a while ago. You know, here's the universal truth. You can take it, you can leave it. I don't care. And when people take it, it makes me feel like, oh, wait, I'm doing the right thing. What say you? Oh, yeah. And, and I understand that. And you are, I mean, you are helping people because like I said, 
you have, like you said, Olympic coaches and trainers that are telling you, no, this is that and another. And I can remember, and I, if she sees this, if they said, you know, I'm one of those personalities that I hope you can tell that I really don't give a damn. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I like about you. <laughs> so I walked up to the trainers one day and uh, I said, hey, I'm going to lose weight. One of the guys was like, how much are we talking? Eh, about 100 pounds. He was like, how much do you weigh? And I told him, I was like, 322.8, waited this morning. This whole, like that morning in August changed my whole life. And you know what he said? He's like, Rod, I remember, because uh, Bobby, actually, he he was in college when I was running track. So he saw me when I was lean. Yeah. He said, I trust yeah. you. He's like, I, he's like, I know you know your body. I trust you. And the other trainer, she said, uh, why do you want to lose so much weight? I was like, because I feel miserable. I look miserable, and I, I, I've never been this big, and I don't want to be this big anymore. And she said, how are you going to do it? And I said, I'm a fast. I'm going to do fasting and keto. I'm going to do intermittent fasting, fasting, and keto. And I'm going to start, I'm going to change my body. I'm going to change it back to the point where I don't need sugars or I don't want sugars. That's the problem. You, you People don't realize it's, you have trained your body to want sugars because it's an addiction. Yeah. And she was like, no. So she went and talked to the head coaches and everybody. And I, me being who I am, I said, I don't give a damn what y'all say. I'm a grown man. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. said, even if you tell me not to, I said, the, the only thing that you can change is if my performance changes. Then you can tell me, well, this might be an issue, so we don't have to pay you. Right. My performance has gotten so much better, and I'm not even close to my goal weight. From wow. 322 to 259, I go to practice every morning now, and I'm still – I'm not the biggest person on the team anymore, but I'm one of them. I'm in better shape, and I'm faster than guys that are 175 pounds. Wow. And you've only lost 63 pounds. you got more to go. Yes, and that's what I'm telling them. I'm like, I like this works. Like, if, if people just stop being so closed up in this box – and trying to give in to, I know people don't want to hear it. You're giving in to like commercialism, like capital, like these people are like, they do these commercials because they want to make millions and billions of dollars off these people. You don't need Coca-Cola. You don't need Sprite. You don't, you don't need all these breads. You don't need pizza and hamburgers. People back then, like when I say back then, 1882, did they have McDonald's? Nope. Not to my knowledge, they didn't. That's why they were so lean and healthier. And, 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 and like they might have died from an infection because they couldn't get to the hospital in time. But as far as obesity, arthritis, heart conditions, they didn't have any of that stuff. And I started reading up on it. And I was like, this is the stuff that I did when I was younger. And everybody told me that it was wrong. And now that I'm reading up on it and I'm researching it, I'm like, I was doing it the right way. And I didn't even know what the hell I was doing. And I'm going back to that, and it's working. I feel great. My kid loves it, Avea, because she does youth track practice. So I'll do my track practice, and then I'll go race against her and do her workouts. And she loves the fact that, you know, her dad is this big old um, 43-year-old guy, and all the other parents are over there fat sitting on the sideline. And she's like, my daddy's practicing with us. He's damn right I am. You got to love that. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, I love it. Rod, uh, it, whenever you get a chance, uh, I have three documentaries out there. One is called Fat a Documentary. That was the first one. Uh, we talk about the beginning of, of all of that. Uh, there's Fat a Documentary, too. And then the third one is called Beyond Impossible, where I go after this fake meat industry. Um, watch, them, watch them in that order. You can get them all on Amazon Prime. Um, or if you, I think, I think they're on, some of them are on YouTube, like the paid version of YouTube. Um, they're on Vimeo, any, any place where you can watch movies. It, some of them are on airline or some, you know, Malaysian Airlines carried it. I think Alaska and Delta had my movies at some now, point. But, you know, I, that's uh, what they're all about. I got Beyond Impossible. What was the first two fat? Uh, the first one is called Fat a Documentary. That's the whole name of it. And then the other one is Fat a Documentary 2 that I put out during the pandemic. And then Beyond Impossible just came out. It's like it's a brand new documentary. You're gonna love you're gonna love what you see there. So give those a look. Um, hang on just a second. I want to say goodbye to you off the air if you, if you have a minute. Oh, I do. I do. Folks, if you like what's going on here, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, please go to VinnyTortoris.com. <clears throat> Click through the banner, bookmark it, use it every time. 
That's how I get away, folks, without doing a whole lot of ads during this show. I count on you guys doing that. It puts a little coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. I'm able to keep this podcast free. We've done over 2,100 episodes, and they're all free because you guys go to me before you go to Amazon. And I really enjoy that um, because I don't make anything from this podcast, but a lot of people work behind the scenes, and we have to keep those people employed. So please do that. Also, we have a super fan page at VinnyTartarus.com. Check that out. I read each and every name every morning. It's how I start my day. And I thank every one of you guys for doing that because without your donations, we couldn't keep this podcast free um, because of the bandwidth and everything else and all the people work here. You can go check out everything Roderick is doing. I just put his name in. There's also a football player, an NFL football player by the same name. Put in Roderick Green and then put in Paralympics behind it. And then just everything you want to see about this guy, everything you want to know about this guy is there. Roderick, if you can really quickly, uh, where can they go if they want to donate to any of your charity work? Um, there's uh, two places you can go. You can go to abisports.org. So that's A-B-I sports with an S at the end dot org. Or they can find me on Instagram, R-D-G-11 B-T-V. And then uh, those those you can message me uh, personally and just say, hey, saw you on Vinny's pa- uh, podcast. I uh, would like to help out. And I read all of my Instagrams uh, personally and I always send messages back personally. And then that way I can link you up. Uh, through uh, Instagram to where you could uh, donate that way. Cool. folks. Go check out everything this guy is doing. He, he's, uh, a, he's a force of nature. I love what this guy's up to. Go check it out. As a matter of fact, when I go into my Instagram tonight, I have to hook myself up to him because um, uh, I'm not there yet. So I will be on his Instagram and checking out everything he's doing also. On behalf of Roderick Green, my name is Vinny Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.